God because God always tells us, I love you. Amen. You hear that again? <laughs> I love you. It's what God wants us to know this morning. <coughs> and he's gone to great lengths always to be close to us and show us a way around difficult times as well as ways we can be joyful and take every day and count it as so, let's join together in the call to worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And by and heaven and death, we belong to God. Baptized into Christ's death, we live unto him. Come, let us worship God. And we got a good hymn this morning. 510, Jesus, thou joy of loving hearts. Yeah. 
said, Amen. God of mercy and promise to forgive those who truly repent. Help us to accept your forgiveness and dwell in us by your spirit. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Take a moment to share the peace. <coughs> go to our prayer for the morning. Let us bow once more. Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of your presence, open the mind of God to us, that in your light we may see light and your strength be strong. Amen. Amen. This morning's uh, scripture is taken from a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a very young church. Uh, it's no way to be compared with any kind of institution that has a set way of doing things. They're new, and babies struggle when they're born, and this is a baby church. And this church is located on the southwest corner of the nation we now call Turkey. And uh, once, uh, a long time ago, it was one of the most Christian nations in the world. These days, it's mainly dominated by those who practice Islam. The times have changed that. But anyway, here's Paul writing to a young church, and it applies to any church even in our day. And here's what he's got to say in his letter. I, therefore, the prisoner and the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. To each of us who is given grace, according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does that mean? But he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might, well, he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, or by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in 
and building itself up in love. May God grant us understanding in the words that each one of us, each one of us has heard. Now, this letter is called an encyclical, which meant it went from church to church around the Mediterranean area. There's a little history on it on this particular letter. We need each other unless we wish to become very disheartened. One of the most beautiful sights in all of nature is the thrill of spotting large flocks of Canada geese heading north or south depending on the season. And having moved up from uh, Chincoteague Island on the eastern shore of Virginia, this year a lot of the bird populations were down for some odd reason. But uh, when we were moving around September, geese were busy. This last month, geese were busy. I haven't seen many yet up here, but I'm assuming they may have already gone from these parts. Although I take that back, Monroe's got some around the mill pond, <laughs> along with the gulls. It comes back very quick. But these geese share a common direction and a common uh, communication. The geese also fly in formation and accept help from each other. So that when the lead goose gets tired, someone rotates and takes a position. Well, it sounds like elders and deacons, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and the V-shaped is the work of God. The geese encourage one another by honking. Well, each one of us makes certain noises depending on our situation. <laughs> the geese check up on one another should one get sick, wounded, or die. Sounds like the church too, doesn't it? But the geese provide as a symbol for the church's grace and good form and unity. For instance, the Church of Scotland, which basically is a Presbyterian church, proudly displays the goose as the symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so like their musical publisher for that church is called Wild Goose Publications. <laughs> Such is the symbol that's got being provided by God for working and flying together in a common direction. <clears throat> and so as you've heard Paul's letter to the Christians at Ephesus, the desire by the Apostle Paul is for the young Christians, many came from pagan and other backgrounds, to come to know Christ and to work together for the good of the church, which again, some of the times we misuse the word church, often referring to a building, when in fact the church is a people being called out to service. The Greek word is ekklesia, assembled to go out. And that's the nature of the church. I mean, we could do without buildings, like say overhead, <laughs> or at least heating. <laughs> but uh, you know, there's importance for us to be putting our lives forward for Christ in the world. And seriously, that's the way we grow. And it's the Lord who's promised to be with us all through the life we lead. We just need to keep on talking and sharing and working together with Jesus. So that's the desire to work in unity. And make no mistake, the geese, when you see them on the ground, they kind of waddle around. I once had the idea of doing a Sunday service on an island where geese had been. <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't too great a cause. <laughs> but you see, these young Christians are facing problems and they need to work together. And some of them came from a Jewish background, so you know, they bring in, you know, how do you reconcile and work together? Ephesus is a young bunch of folks. And so God today is still calling the church to rise up 
community being made stronger by the work of the Holy Spirit and that we should reach to that which demonstrates the gracefulness of God. And it makes sense to know the Christ in our faith and yet also practice it. The Apostle Paul reminds us that Christ called the church into being. And he goes on to state that Christ does not divide himself. And yet he says here that Christ is seen as being one with God the Father. Now, Christ provides unity and direction and communication. And there's certain words here that I've picked out that uh, I did a little extra thinking on. He demonstrates five qualities. And that's what Paul is pointing to this morning. The first one is humility. Humility means that Christ knew who he was and to whom he belonged. He knew that the Father was the Father indeed and had power and had caused Christ to come into being as well as that of the Holy Spirit. He did not rest on his laurels but worked together as a trinity. A second word that I might add one more thought to uh, uh, that first word humility Think about how God humbled himself on the cross. He didn't need to do that. Could have been tempted, was tempted, but he made sure that the cross is a symbol for us to remember him by, that there's sacrifice to be made as Christians, knowing that the Lord walks with us. The second word is meekness. <coughs> That is, he points out that Christ always had anger as part of his toolkit, but he meekness means to be angry at the right time, not the wrong time. You might remember Jesus in the temple courtyard who saw all these tables with doves for sale and other things that could be sacrificed. But yet his anger was aroused by people selling doves and other things for sacrifice at exorbitant prices. They were being gouged in the courtyard near the temple. And he lost his anger and overturned all those tables and the money that was being made at the expense of poor, suffering people. Another word that came to mind is long-suffering. That's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You'll find that in Galatians chapter 5. But I want to mention here a spirit that never gives in. That's long-suffering. And he taught his disciples this by the example of his own life. Love is another a quality. And it's not an emotional thing. Love is a commitment. In our society, we spend a lot of time thinking about romantic love, sexually, physically, and it's just emotionally. But what love is a commitment to be with others through thick and thin, to be beside each other, bring out the best in each other. And then peace, peace being a right relationship between us all. When it came to thinking about drinking from the cup of death, Christ could have let it pass, but he drank from that cup. Now these are ways that Jesus set a direction and practiced healthy communication. The disciples learned by seeing, and most of us learn by seeing rather than by hearing. And that's what draws us. I mean, we saw people, we saw people do this. You know, you, you have a testimony. You can share it. But you know, I've got to know that Jesus always was aware that there are decoys. 
that are attracting uh, these geeks, these young Christians. And there still are many gods out there, gods of, of racism and greed, personal politics. Boy, I we have a lot, a lot of that. It's a pleasure. But like geese, we have a rallying cry, and one of the early creeds of the Christian faith was, is found in that letter I read to you this morning. And here it is. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. It's one of the tensions in the early church was, who do you follow? Do you follow Christ, or Apollos, or Cephas? You know, it could go in many directions. But the church ought to be focused on one. Jesus. And we do need to do to do that with each other. When the church is healthy in the spirit, it's much like uh, thinking about your own body this morning. Now, all of us have a circulatory system, system, don't we? That's where the blood is being pumped through the body. You have high blood pressure, the doctor will tell you, or low blood pressure, maybe just right. <laughs> maybe you gotta take a pill or so to get the blood pressure to where it needs to be. In our case, it's the word of God being pumped through our system, which invigorates us. Now we know what happens when our blood is out of kilter, but just imagine when we're pumped through with the grace of God, which that's unearned love. And we feel like a million bucks. You know, it's not to be forgotten, we sometimes feel that when we're at our best, we're like Christ. I feel like I'm walking on water today. <laughs> and that's where we want to be, to be filled with the Spirit. One of the things that also helped us in the circulatory system here about pumping good news is to look at your fingers. Because Jesus has put in, us into contact with people whom we can influence. Now, sometimes you think, go out and get a new member someplace. You know, that's a threat if you don't know anybody. But think about it this way. Think about people who you already know and maybe are seldom going to church or not going to church. Maybe it's your cousin or the person you work with, your veteran in your veterans organization, uh, card playing. Some of us like to play games of cards. But you're close to people. And sometimes all we have to say is, you know, I'd like to invite you. Can I give you a ride? Now, don't be dismayed if they say no. Well, you plant a seed. See, a lot of times we think it's all up to us. We're part of it. But we got to remember, Jesus is at work. And at the right time, that person will step forward. Just don't give up too soon. <laughs> Just remember that there's somebody working with you who goes side by side with you wherever you go. That's Jesus. But that's a circulatory system. Like last week, uh, we had faith stories being shared here in worship. You know, and that those are good to hear how Christ is working with people. Also, circulatory system, but you know my body hangs together, <laughs> kind of just like yours. You got a skeletal system. Effective Christian education is a skeletal system. And it's been shown through studies that effective Christian education builds loyalty to the church because we come to know Jesus Christ. And we practice, we keep learning. I think these days, one of the, 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 a lot of people, I should say, are going back and looking at the early church and how they practiced education. And there's more and more writing over the last, I'd say, five to ten years 
of a need for the church to rediscover itself as an intergenerational learning body. For, and I was reading this, the kids of every age with adults were in groups together or learned at home together. I don't know if I remember the time that Martin Luther had the short catechism, the heads of the household learned the catechism when they were at a table. Generations were gathered, and they were there. But a lot of churches have very few kids. And you can see our kids would be dismayed if, hey, I'm the only one showing up. But the thing that helps kids is by kids knowing adults. Because when there's trouble and they can't rely and talk to their parents, and they need someone who's adult and wise, they need to know the names of people who they can relate to. William Willerman, a, a, a good bishop in the uh, United Methodist Church, later stated that uh, most kids know two or three adults who they can turn to in the church. And if kids are showing up and they're probably their kids, well, they don't feel comfortable. But if they can point to everybody and say, I know her or I know him, and you're spending time, aren't you? You're building a group. And we've lost that. You know, you think about kids being involved in drama. Churches used to do drama in the earliest years of the Christian church. The kids, if they want to be drama now, they got to go to school. <laughs> That's a whole wide open area. Uh, if you go to contemporary drama service out in uh, Denver, Colorado, they sell catalogs on maybe a group of five people putting on a play. It's Christian in nature. And it calls for different generations to work together. This is a wide open area because we need to grow. And we need to grow together. One other thing that I was thinking about yesterday, and we had our holiday fair. Now, I used to be an assistant editor of a weekly newspaper and preach on weekends. Mm -hmm. So my job was taking pictures occasionally and uh, <coughs> covering school board and city council meetings. But being close to a paper, I noticed one thing that startled me. In a town of 2000, if you had a weekly paper, you would have five times the amount of civic club news than you ever had of church news. Because there's not much being ever said about churches. Maybe they're on a list in the Times. So yesterday I thought to one of our elders, hey, is anybody taking pictures? <laughs> There they are, right here. And I said, hey, you know, we, we spent time, we got stuff from the Presbyterian newsletter. Why not put one of those pictures where people can see it as a follow-up story? Or save one for next year as a prelude for advertising for this coming holiday fair. And being out in the public, in the print media, is a pretty good thing to do. Now some church, uh, some some uh, newspapers you have to pay for the uh, for you know the listing of the times and dates. But if you've got a picture and out in Nebraska, I bring my pictures in most of the time in print. So it's another wide open area of reaching out as, as a flock of Christians. Or the other thing here, the nervous system. Now, okay, we know circulatory system, we know the skeletal system, we have the nervous system, what is that? Well, if I was to pinch myself, I'd feel it. <laughs> you know when somebody's hurting in the congregation, because you know there's been a death, or maybe a severe cold. <clears throat> I mean, I can remember folks bringing chicken noodle soup over to my house when my wife was ill. And that was valued from information and spent time with members of the church and members of the community. 
possible. But fellowship is a key element in our nervous system when people are hurting. That's another opportunity for Christians to flock together and go out and do the Lord's work. You can see, I think, hopefully from what Paul's saying and what I'm seeing through Paul, we do need each other. And the geese, by flying in a V formation, some of you probably know this already, adds 71% to the range possible for each bird as they move gracefully and uh, quickly. And traveling with others is provided by the Holy Spirit. When we fly in the unity of the Spirit, we can be just as graceful, but much more powerful than high-flying geese. And it is the Holy Spirit that does that for us. And for the building up of the church in the world. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for people like the Apostle Paul, who suffered and put into print what they have seen what they have experienced. And we pray, Lord, you make us keep our eyes open to needs as they come our way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we have an affirmation of faith here, and I borrowed this from the same letter. It's Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. Let's do it together. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. Let's join together in hymn number 442. The church is one foundation.
prayer. Gracious Lord, we have heard the concerns and we raise them up to you. We're thankful that Alexander passed the bar. We pray, Lord, for a career in which she'll walk with the Lord and you will work and walk with her. We ask, Lord, to find two ducks and help her to be healthy. And Lord, we ask to be watching over Dale's family and Pat. Bring strength and comfort to Dale and his family. Be with Shelley in the fight against cancer. Be with the Cooper family, Lord, as well. And with Larry and uh, with little Andrea and with uh, Walter's family. Lord, you bring a lot to life, and we pray, Lord, that you provide healing and new life to those who are needing it. Uh, we ask, Lord, to be. Uh, favorable for tree sales this time around, <laughs> that uh, there may be joy as families and individuals gather around to celebrate your birth. Thank you, gracious Lord, and we ask uh, these uh, in your name, and hear us as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Turn to hymn number 439 in Christ there is no east or west. Thank you. 